And hi again, I'm Terry Lacona from Austin Cinemas. We're back on the stage with Jackie Benson. After, I'm speechless, it was an incredible <laughs> hour plus of, of music. And your debut on the show, like I was saying before the cameras came on, if you were nervous, you didn't show it, Jackie. I think you, you've done this a time or two. Well, it, it's like I feel like I'm at home. You know, I've, I've been to the Moody Theater so many times for a bunch of different productions, and I've known you for years, and I just felt like I was at home playing for my family, you know? <laughs> and you were. Yeah. And being, speaking of which, uh, being a native Austinite, you literally are at home. Yeah. Talk a little bit about, about like, uh, what, what your earliest memories were of growing up in Austin and when you first became interested in music. I know it's in the family. Yeah, oh, yeah, for sure. So my dad's a, my dad's a bass player and a musician, and he uh, was a professional musician in Austin since the 80s when my parents moved here, when everybody's parents moved here. And, um, <laughs> and uh, he, he was just kind of cutting his teeth. He's completely how I learned how to cut my teeth here. And uh, he had he had kind of like the same training grounds as I did, and and uh, my earliest memory, my earliest Austin-y memory, is walking Town Lake with my mom. <laughs> mm. She would need to get her steps in for the week, and we would walk Town Lake. And this was before it was expanded. This was when it was only like four miles instead of like nine, like it is now. And so my earliest memories are like Town Lake and Auditorium Shores and all that stuff. I can't forget those places. <laughs> and music always being around you in the family. Always being around me in the family. Every time I'd, like three times a week, I'd come home from school and my dad would be rehearsing the band for that weekend, that weekend of gigs. And also, funny side note, Rodney, my drummer, was the drummer of my dad's band in the 80s and 90s. <laughs> so when I, I would come home to my future drummer rehearsing with my dad and his band. <laughs> That's quite a connection. Pretty wild, right? Yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah. It is great too. Yeah. All right, well, let's uh, skip ahead a few years, and somehow you find yourself at the Berkeley College of Music studying classical piano. <laughs> so what's well, up with that? It wasn't exactly classical piano. The thing I learned about Berkeley was that I had all these preconceptions about what a music school should be, and they did not match what it actually was. I, I didn't go there to, and mastered in a genre or, or um, got a bachelor's in a genre. I got like a bachelor's in a skill that's the cool thing about that school mm -hmm. so like the piano was not my major it was my instrument and my major was actually composition and studio production and they have a bunch of different types of majors and it's it's probably one of the best schools in America for actually pointing you in the direction of a career in 2020 um, or at that time in 2013 when I oh, graduated God. It's got, or 2011 it's got a great I mean. reputation obviously and it's an honor just to be able to go there yes know? it is it taught me a lot of skills that I still use a lot of arranging skills that I use with my machines and stuff learned a lot so, of but stuff piano like that was your first instrument so how when does the guitar come into the picture so the guitar came into the picture when I was like a cornered college grad you know that moment where you're like a cornered raccoon and you're like what am I gonna do for a living you know that was when it uh, that was when it came in the picture I was like okay I couldn't figure out how to feel like I could be a front man with the piano. I never figured that out. I tried several times for many years, probably about five years I tried. Started singing when I was 16 and I tried to kind of put a show together and it, it just never felt right and I can't put my finger on it and I still can't put my finger on it. And um, when I got back from college, I'm like, I gotta, if I'm gonna be an entertainer, I have to be entertaining. And I just felt like in my gut and in my brain and just thinking about it, I felt like the electric guitar would be a more entertaining frontman instrument and so I started playing it <laughs> all right so I'm trying to get my, my my head around your your musical evolution so it starts with guitar when did you start to sing and and then write songs so I started singing and writing songs actually before the guitar when I was 16 but I was writing them all on the piano and I didn't like how they sounded okay. <laughs> so that was another thing that led me to the guitar I'm like maybe if I play a different instrument I'll write a different type of song which ended up being hundred percent true and I kind of took off running. I liked the songs that I wrote on the guitar, and I just, I just took off running. And I took, I took voice lessons when I was 16, but where I really learned how to sing was when I hosted karaoke for three years while I was learning <laughs> how to play the guitar. <laughs> and next up, we have Christy. Yeah. Give it up for Charles. You know, that I was me for three years. For, <laughs> I wouldn't recommend that for everybody, but in your case, it seems like it helped. Well, the thing three about karaoke, karaoke yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, the thing about karaoke is if, if they're not singing, the host has to sing. Mm -hmm. So I, I literally right. got like, it was like training. I was singing every night. Well, Jackie, I think your karaoke days are over. Yes, thank God. So <laughs> your, your music is all over the map. 
It is, yeah. And it has elements of, of you name it. But uh, what were some of your influences, whether it's rock or soul or blues or, or you know, whatever? Who and what inspired you along the way? So that's such a hard question to answer, but I've had some time to think about it. And honest to God, I truly believe that a lot of a person's music taste comes from the formative years, like the years before age five, where either they're listening to what their parents are listening to or they're listening to something on television, TV shows. I think that was a huge impact on me. Before I was even thinking about playing instruments, I was already listening to like masterful Disney soundtracks. <laughs> I was listening to like Hans Zimmer and Elton John teaming up, you know? And so I think that my biggest influence, honestly, is Disney. <laughs> I know that sounds crazy, but like my arrangement ideas, yeah. the way that I structure my melodies and also the, the meter of my lyrics, yeah. <laughs> it's insane. And a lot of those kinds of influences may be subconscious or subliminal. You're not even, like you say, aware of them in, in your formative uh, years. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So 2020 was supposed to be a big year. And I guess, hey, you're sitting on the stage of Austin City Limits, so it, it is. It is still a big year, Let's yeah. just <laughs> say it is a big year. Yeah. But uh, it hasn't exactly um, turned out the way you thought. And we could all say the same. Yeah. You had plans for a big tour starting in the spring. You had plans and still do for new music to come out. And suddenly, um, like with the rest of us, the, the world turned on its head and we had to rethink what we're doing and how. Yeah. How did you rethink what you were doing with your with your music and how to connect with, with your fans? It was, I was truly blessed with the timing. So about two years ago, I started wanting to work smarter, not harder. Touring was so hard and it was hard to get the word out. So I realized about two years ago that I was going to have to start integrating the internet in with my business. I realized it a while ago, but I never went for it really, really hard because I never had the time. You know, you're out of town six months a year, you're home for a week, you're gone for three months. So I, I did it in between. I kind of developed it on the side. But then this year hit and everything closed and everybody immediately went to the internet. And I was like, okay, I was doing the internet at volume three and now I'm just gonna turn it up to volume 10. And then that's pretty much what it was. I was already kind of doing it, and then I just switched from kind of doing it to really doing it. <laughs> but you've got to miss that that energy. I mean, that's what drives so much music is that that live connection, the chemistry, the magic in the air. You know, when you've got that crowd of people out in front. Yeah. And uh, I, I'm sure you miss it, and we know it's coming back someday. It's we don't know when. No. But this is as good a way as any to really connect with those people in the meantime. It is, and, and I, my dad kind of gave me the perspective of like always seeing everything as practice, everything as rehearsal. So even though I dearly miss like going out and seeing faces and giving people's hugs and making people dance and dancing with them, I miss all of that. But I feel like this crazy year where I landed this amazing opportunity where I don't have an audience, it, w it was so serendipitous that I spent four months streaming for cameras without an audience mm -hmm. to do the first year that Austin City Limits had to do without an audience. So I, I kind of choose to see it the way my dad sees it. It was like training ground for where I am now. And, and I know that everything will, will be back at some point. And so I'm just being patient. <laughs> what more can we do? Be pa what more can be we patient. do indeed? Well, so we cannot be patient. <laughs> finally, you talked about this during your show, and obviously the dress you're wearing yeah. makes a statement itself about Black Lives Matter. It's, it seems so easy to say, it needs to be said, and it is almost revolutionary that so many people seem to finally be waking up and, and realizing mm -hmm. how important it is. But I think the, the, the point that you made tonight that uh, struck me was it goes beyond just saying Black Lives Matter because they are people. Those are names, are names of those of lives people. who are on your dress tonight. Yeah, and some of them are six years old. Some of them are 12. Some of them are children. And, and as we all know, and as has been proven time and time again, you know, down through the, the generations, music is a way of reaching out to people. Yes, it is. To sending a message to people and yes. to try to bring people together. Yeah. My message is that this isn't, this isn't political. This is about humanity and about morality. That's my message. I'm not trying to tell you who to vote for. I'm not trying to tell you what to think. I'm just begging you 
to have a moral code and to find murder wrong. That's all I want. And to believe that people who do that should be held accountable. That's it. It's a question of like literal morals and humanity. And it's so simple. It's but very it's, simple. It's, it's so important. Yes. What a great note to end on. And thank you so much, Jackie yeah. Venson, for your great performance tonight. Great chance to sit and chat and talk about you and your music. And congratulations on all your successes and all of those to come. And I have a feeling the next time you're on this stage, <laughs> there will be a real audience oh, yeah. out front. <laughs> Maybe you guys could throw me a rain check show. I'm just I, saying. We don't have to tape it. It could just be I a rain check feeling, show. I'm just saying. I have a feeling there'll be other opportunities <laughs> down the road here. You we'll know what I'm saying? We'll see what happens. Well, either way, I'm just I'm honored to share a city with you and with Austin City Limits and everything you guys do for the community. So Great. The thank you is mutual. Very, the gratitude, I mean, is mutual. <laughs> All right. Best of luck to you. Have a great night. Thanks. You too. <laughs>